Welcome to 3-2. We are talking about how to graph polynomials. This is a super fun section. Um, we're going to draw some things that are a little bit more complicated than a quadratic. And we're going to start with functions that are already in factored form. Um, in section 3-3, we'll talk about what to do if they're not factored. But for now, uh, we'll start here. Anytime I ask you to graph something, two things that you will always want to do are find the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts. So that is where we will start with this. Hopefully you already put um, this on a note card. We talked about this a uh, couple sections ago. When I ask you to find the x-intercept, what you're going to do is plug in 0 for y. So I take this equation and I plug in 0 here for y. And because it's already factored, all I have to do is say, where is this going to be 0? Well, this is going to be 0 if one of these three quantities equals 0. So basically, I set each of these equal to 0 and figure out what my solutions are, just like you would with a factored quadratic. Only now we have three things set equal to zero, three solutions instead of just two. So I'm going to get x equals three, x equals negative five, and x equals positive two. Those are my x-intercepts. My y-intercepts, that should be on a note card too. How do you find your y-intercepts? On the back, it should say plug in zero for x. So that means we're going to find f of 0, and I plug in 0 to all of these spots, and I get negative 3 times a 5 times a negative 2, and that is going to give me a negative 15 times a negative 2, which is a positive 30. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and graph. Now, um, the y-intercepts on these can end up being either very big or very small. So what I will say is that you do not have to graph the y-intercept accurately. So if it's 30, just put a mark up here and we'll call this 30. Just label it and it doesn't have to be to scale. Um, the x x-intercepts, however, I'd like those to be to scale. They will usually be in the range of a normal graph. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put a po point at 3, negative 5, and 2. And then what we do is we just basically play a game of connect the dots. This graph is going to snake through all of these points and it can't cross back over itself because it's a function. So you have to kind of connect them. What I do is I always start on the left here and you have to connect them in order. So I'm gonna take this dot and I'm coming up through here and I've gotta connect the 30 next because that's what I come to next. Then I have to drop steeply down to get to this and then I come back around to connect with that point there. Okay, and that's the graph of the function. Now, it's possible that you're asking yourself, well, how do you know that it did that and it didn't do something like this, right? I mean, you know, we've seen things do that and it could come down here, it could bounce off this, it could do some crazy things like that. How come you're going through all of these x-intercepts instead of doing like a parabola on them or a bounce on them? That would be a very good question to ask. And the answer is because the power on all of these factors is one. Anytime you have a, a factor that's to the power of one, what that means is that you are going to go straight through that x-intercept. So that eliminates any possibility of the orange line because it can't sit on any of those and it has to go straight through. So we are left with only the white line as your option. Okay, now what if it does have a higher power than one? I'm so glad you asked. Let's look at that. 
So say I have f of x equals x plus 2 squared times x minus 3. So again, we're going to find our x-intercepts and our y-intercepts. x-intercepts, I'm going to plug 0 in for y. And now, when I set each of these quantities equal to 0, I'm going to get x equals negative 2 and x equals 3. Okay, And your y-intercept is going to be plug in 0. So this is going to be 4 times a negative 3 is going to be negative 12. So again, that negative 12 does not have to be to scale. It's a little bit bigger than most of your graphs will be. I'm just going to put it down here and call this negative 12. Just make sure if it's negative, it's down. If it's positive, it's up. Now, my x-intercepts are at negative 2 and at 3. So I need, I need the graph to touch or go through at the, both of those places. Well, if you'll notice, this 2 right here is a squared, and that is actually going to change the shape of, a gra of the graph at this x-intercept. And what it's going to do, if it's a 2, that means that the graph is going to bounce off of this point. Now, it can bounce one of two ways. It can bounce like this, coming down, okay, or it could come up and bounce as well. And the question is, well, which one does it do? And the answer is dictated by the next point. Remember, we're going to read this graph from left to right. We're going this way. And if I go this way, um, the negative 2 is my first stop along the way. The next point that I need to connect to is this one. And so the question is, is the pink graph heading towards that next point or is the orange graph? And the answer is it's the pink graph because the pink graph is coming down towards my next point of intersection. So that would be the choice. In order to make the orange graph come to negative 12 next, I'd have to bend it around and create another x-intercept to get it back down to negative 12, which is illegal because the only places you can connect these graphs are at negative 2 and 3. Okay, so the orange graph's out of the picture. We're going to continue with the pink graph, and the next um, point of intersection along the way going left to right is the 3. So from negative 12, I'm going to come up. Now, the 3 has a power of 1, which means that this graph, just like our first one, is going to come up and go straight through the line. Okay, And that's what this graph looks like. Another example. just adding in new different powers. So this squared means that I am going to bounce on this x-intercept, which is 1. Um, the question is, what does this cube do? We haven't talked about that yet. So let's calculate our x-intercepts first. We're setting y equal to 0. And when I set each of those quantities equal to 0, I'm going to get negative 2 and a positive 1. And my y-intercept, I'm going to plug in 0 for x. And I'm going to get 8 times a, neg or a positive 1, because that negative 1 squares. Whoops. Sorry, this is supposed to be a 0. Okay, the negative 1 squares gives me a positive 1, so my y-intercept is at 8. All right, that's not too big of a number, so we could probably hit that a little more accurately than we've been doing the others. So let's do that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right there. And then my x-intercept's at negative 2 and a positive 1. So what happens? I know that this squared means that I'm going to bounce. 
So I can either bounce at one like this, or I can bounce like this. And the question is which one? Well, the next dot in line that I need to hit is my y-intercept. So which one is going towards my y-intercept? It is the orange line. Okay, so it's going to do something like this. This is really cramped. Let me, um, let me spread these points out a little bit. Hold on. I'm going to make this scale um, a little bit bigger. So I'm going to call this one. I'm going to go by threes. And this is going to be negative two. That'll just help us be able to see a little bit better. Okay, so let's draw the options again. I can parabola up like this, or I can parabola down like this. But the orange one is the one that's heading towards the next point. So this is going to come up, go through here. Now that doesn't mean that this is the maximum necessarily. It might be that um, the orange graph is coming up and goes through and maxes out over here. We don't know that and at this point in the game we don't care. All right. What, the, what you're going to do in calculus is you're going to figure out where is the max. For, for our purposes, all I care is the shape of the graph is, is roughly correct. So that means that you're doing the orange line in this case instead of the pink line, that you're hitting your x-intercepts. So where the max and min is doesn't really matter to me at this point. Now I'm coming back down through this and I'm going to come towards the negative 2. What happens, the negative 2 is a key, what we call a cube root. And what happens on a cube root is the graph wiggles through it. So that looks like this. It does one of those little 45 degree through the middle and then down from there. All right, so single roots pass straight through, double roots bounce, and triple roots do the little wiggle through. Now, how in the world, why does that happen and how would you remember that? Okay, let's remember our parent graphs. Here's three that you should know what they look like. All right, my first question is, what's the x-intercept on each of these? Well, if we calculate the x-intercept on each of these graphs, I plug in 0 for y and I get... 0 equals x squared, x cubed, and if you solve all of these, you get x equals 0, x equals 0, and x equals 0. Square root and cube root both sides. So the x-intercepts are all 0 on these. Okay, let's draw them. We know what they look like. So here's my x-intercept, and this is a line. That means that I'm going to go from that x-intercept, I'm going to go up 1 over 1, and it looks like this. Look what's happening at the x-intercept. It's going straight through. Okay, now let's look at this one. X-intercept is at zero, except look at this. It's got a power of two. It's a double x-intercept. And what does this graph look like? Looks like that. So it bounces off of that. And then this one x-intercept also of 0, but it's a triple root, and this is what we know this graph looks like. It's doing that little wiggle through the middle. So these parent graphs were following these rules all along. We just didn't articulate it. And so now what we're saying is, hey, every time you have an x-intercept and it's a double, it's going to act like a parabola. If it's a triple, it's going to act like a cubic. And if it's a single one, it's going to act like a line going through there. All right? And then all your problems just mix and match um, these, um, these types of roots, the, the cubics, the squares. Now, what I would do is this. You have the idea. I would stop this video, I would back up to the beginning, and I would, when I write down a problem, I would try to 
um, sketch it on your own as practice. And then fast forward through the answer, check, make sure you drew it right, and then go to the next one. I would do these three problems again and make sure that you can do them before we go on to the next um, section. All right. Hopefully you did that. You paused the video and you practiced those three. Let's talk about um, another scenario that happens. Do that okay um, directions are going to say graph on this so X intercepts I set each of these quantities equal to 0 and I get X equals 0 negative 2 and 5 all right, y-intercept, I'm going to plug in 0 for x. And this 0 is going to wipe everything out. It's 0 times 2 times 25, which is 0. All right, so I have x-intercept at 0, at negative 2, and 5. This 5 is a double root, which means that the graph is either going to bounce like this or it's going to bounce like this. And then these other two are, are single powers, so we're just going to go straight through those two points. And my question is, do you pick the pink graph or the orange graph? This is a unique problem. Because my y-intercept is zero, I don't have that extra guiding point that I had in the other problems, where either this orange is gonna go up towards a positive y-intercept, or this pink graph is gonna go down towards a negative y-intercept. The y-intercept's here at zero, and so I can turn either one of these graphs to head towards zero um, without doing anything illegal. So how do I know which one to do? The answer is when you have a y-intercept of zero, you need to pick another point to plug in. And I just usually pick something easy, like let's say x equals 1. Now you can't pick one of your x-intercepts, you'll just get 0. But you, you want to pick another number that we don't have a value for. So let's look at what f of 1 is. I plug 1 in for x here, 1 in for x here, and 1 in here. I get 1 times 3 times, um, this is going to be a negative 4 squared is 16. So 18 uh, looks like 48. Okay, so the, the point 1 comma 48 is on the graph. Now, that's really high, all right? But the idea is that at 1, I'm up here somewhere, high, right? I mean, I, it's way, way up past my scale. But the point is that it's close to the orange graph. It's not down here where the pink graph is heading towards. It's up top where the orange graph is heading towards. So that, that tells me that the orange graph is the one I'm going for. So I erase the pink options and I'm gonna just erase part of that and kind of correct it so it's kind of smooth. So I'm gonna come up here and then I'm gonna head back down steeply towards zero. Now again, how high is this? I realize that that's not high enough. We're supposed to be way up at 48. But again, we don't care in this class how high your max is. We just care that you're doing the right shape of the graph. And then in calculus, we'll calculate the max and min. So this orange line is going to continue down. Now what do I do through zero? Zero is a single root, so I go straight through it. And then I curve back up. And what do I do at negative two? It's a single root, so I go straight through it. You only bounce on doubles, and you only wiggle through triples. So this should be kind of a, I probably drew this a little funky. This should come straight through. No, no wiggles on that. Just kind of like that. All right.
right? And that's what your graph looks like. So special case when y is, y intercept is zero, that you have to plug in an extra point to pick which graph um, you want to draw. All right. Um, another situation that you will face in this homework is a function that can easily be factored. So let's take a look at this one. Game plan's the same. I want to find my x-intercept first, so I'm going to plug in 0 for y. And when I look at this, we learned in Algebra 2 that any time you have a polynomial set equal to 0, you factor. That's always your game plan when you have a polynomial set equal to 0. No black magic. Black magic does stuff like this. Eight, add the 8x over and then do some kind of like cube root both sides or something crazy like this. This is horrible. This is black magic. Okay? Don't do that. You want a polynomial set equal to zero. Factor. All right, how do we factor? Quick review. Your first game plan, let's put it under here for factoring. Your first game plan is, um, is there a greatest common factor? Is there something that you can pull out of every term? If not, the second thing that you want to look for is um, grouping. And we will develop this list further next section. For now, these are your two techniques for factoring that you'll be using. So I'm gonna look at my problem and say, do all of these terms have something in common? Oh yeah, they do. They all have an X. So that means that I'm gonna do this greatest common factor and I'm gonna pull an X out of each term, which is gonna give me X squared, two X minus eight. And what that does is it leaves me with a quadratic and I know how to factor quadratics. I'm going to make two quantities, and I want two numbers that are going to multiply to give me negative 8 and add to give me positive 2. So I'm going to pick a plus 4 and a minus 2. And when I'm done factoring, I always just multiply the thing out again to make sure I did it right, just to check myself. And I do that in my head. I'll write it down one time for you, but um, I do this in my head. So this x squared... This is going to be 4x minus 2x and then minus 8. Oh yeah, these combine to give me 2x and that's what I started with. So that looks like I factored it correctly. Good. And now I can set each quantity equal to 0. So that means x is going to be 0, 2, and negative 4. Those are my x-intercepts. All right. My y-intercept is going to be found by plugging in 0 for x. So my y-intercept is going to be 0. So this is going to be a case like our previous problem. I am going to need to plug in an extra point on this to figure out which way my graph orients. Okay, I'm going to draw this a little bit differently for you this time so you can think about it differently. My x-intercepts are going to be 0, 2, and negative 4. They're all single roots. These powers up here on my factored form are all ones. So this graph's gonna go straight through all these points. So there's two ways that I can draw this. And sometimes the way people's brain works, it helps to draw the two options and then see which makes sense. So I'll just draw it completely both ways. You could draw this. This graph goes through all the x-intercepts. It doesn't have any additional x-intercepts and um, it goes straight through all the points because they're all single roots. But this does also. 
See that? That follows all the rules too. It's just backwards. It's just flipped across the x-axis. So the question is which one's which? And that's where your extra point co comes in. I'm going to pick a point. You can pick any point except for your x-intercepts. So I'm going to pick x equals 1 again and plug that into the function. So this is going to be 1 plus 2 minus 8, which is going to be a negative 5. So the point 1, negative 5 is on the graph. Well, where is that? That's 1, negative 5. That's going to be 1, 4, 5 down here. Now, I didn't make the pink graph fall deep enough there, but I can see that the pink graph is the one that's going to be able to connect with that. Now, I can go back and draw that a little more accurately if I want to, now that I kind of know that, um, that value. It's not really necessary, but you can see that your answer has to be the pink graph. There's no way that the orange graph at 1 is going to go through negative 5. It just because it's above the x-axis. So then I can go back and say, well, it's not that one. It must be the pink one. And that's my final answer. So that's what it looks like to have to be able to factor something. Uh, the procedure is the same after factoring, though. Let me do one with grouping. Grouping is a factoring technique that you may not remember from Algebra 2. So a quick review. All right, x-intercepts first. Oops, I'm plugging in 0 for y. And I see that my polynomial is not factored, so I need to factor it. And I look at all my terms, and they do not have something in common. Now, some of them do, but they don't all four have one thing in common. The 16 doesn't have an x. The x to the fourth doesn't have a 2. So that means that the greatest common factor is not going to work in this case, which leads me to grouping. There's something very unique about grouping. There's always an even number of terms. So if you look, if I look at a problem and I see that I have four terms, that's a big flag that grouping's probably going to work. So here's how we do it. You take your problem and you split it down the middle. And we're going to treat these as two separate polynomials, the one on the left and one on the right. And you're going to t figure out what is the greatest common factor of just the left two. So I look at those and I say, well, they both have three x's. So I'm going to take three x's out. And that's going to leave me with an x minus 2 here. Then I'm going to look at the right-hand side. What's my greatest common factor over here? And I say it's an 8. Now, you have an option of pulling out a positive 8 or a negative 8, and you get to choose that. The way you decide is you look, you compare the signs on the two sides. So over here on the left, I have a positive term and a negative term. If those, term, those signs are the same on the right, then you pull out a positive 8 on the second part. If the signs are flip-flopped, then you want to pull out a negative, okay? So the goal is to make the signs be in the same order. So what I'm left with here is x minus 2. And what happens in grouping, if, if grouping does indeed work, these leftover quantities will always be the same. And then what you're doing is you're taking these two terms and you're pulling out the greatest common factor, which is now the x minus 2. So that comes out in front as your greatest common factor, and you're left with the x cubed and the positive 8. And that is factored right there. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this. 
my at my quantity set equal to zero. And at, this is going to give me x equals 2. And this one, let's look at it carefully, minus 8. And then I'm going to cube root both sides. And the cube root of minus 8 is a negative 2. So I'm also going to have an x-intercept of negative 2. Next, we're going to calculate our y-intercept. So we're going to plug in 0 for x. and I get negative 16. All right, let's draw. X-intercept of positive 2, X-intercept of negative 2, Y-intercept of negative 16, down here, way, okay? And again, doesn't need to be on to scale on the Y-axis. Now, What's happening with these? This is obviously a single root, okay? It's got a one up there. This turns out is also a single root. What does this cube do? Well, it messes with um, an internal part of the graph. What that cube does is there's probably gonna be a little bit of a wiggle somewhere, but it's not at the root. The root here is considered a single root because the power's not on the outside. The power has to be on the outside of the factor to be considered a double. So this thing is coming down through this point as a single root, something here and something here. Now, is it a parabola? No, it's not. There's something else going on with this cubic. You will figure out what that is in calculus, but for now, let me just show you what I'm talking about. Um, if we go over to class calc and we take a look at the graph, I have it graphed right here. Um, Look at what happens. Here's your um, your x-intercepts are right here and here. You can see that they're single roots. The graph is going straight through. Your y-intercept is down here at negative 16. Do you see this little wiggle right here? That is what the cubic is doing to it. Now, whether or not you draw that in there is not important to me because this, for our purposes right now, is close enough to a parabola that that, that shape will do. So again, what I'm looking for is, did you get your x-intercepts right, your y-intercept right, and is the general shape correct? Now, whether or not you put a little tiny you know, wiggle in this part of the graph or not is not important at this point, okay? So some of those, um, you know, some of them are a little bit weird like that, and again, I encourage you to use your calculator is a tool. Go over, if something look, looks weird, go over to the calculator, graph it, take a look at it. I will be requiring you to show your work. How did you factor and how did you calculate your intercepts? So uh, you still need to know how to do these by hand, but for sure you should be checking your work and looking at anything that's an oddity on your graphing calculator. Okay, that's all for section um, 3-2. Let me leave you with one last thought on um, just a quick check. Say you're graphing something and you've got your x and y intercepts, something like this. I see this a lot. Um, and I know it seems funny when I'm going to explain it right now, but... Um, it, it happens when you're not quite thinking through stuff. So say all of these guys are single roots. So I see people do stuff like this a lot. I'm gonna go through here, I'm gonna go through here, and then, uh-oh, I need to get to this y-intercept, so I'm gonna do this. Now what happened is you created an extra x-intercept that you didn't previously intend to have. So that is a common mistake that people make. The other thing that can happen in in this kind of situation, you have um, x-intercept, y-intercept, like this. Okay, say all of these are single. And people can start connecting dots in wrong orders. They do things like this. 
So look at what happens when I, I go, I connect this one, and instead of the next one in line, I jump over to this third one first and then go back. This is not a function because it does not pass a vertical line test. So two things I would suggest when you're done drawing. One, check for extra x-intercepts that you may have inadvertently made in an attempt to connect dots. Two, make sure that, you, that um, your drawing is a function. And that will eliminate probably 90% of the mistakes that I see on homework. So go ahead and give those a try, and I'll see you next.